That's encouraging. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 John. If you want to get involved with Christian Motorcyclist Association, uh, these, these, these fine people would love to talk to you after church. Charlie is one of ours, so he'll be here. Uh, he's a permanent fixture here at uh, Cowboy Church, so just get with him. And, uh, you know, I get the question all the time, do you got to have a horse to come to Cowboy Church? Of course you don't, but do you have to have a motorcycle? To, you don't have to have a motorcycle to get involved. So there you go. Uh, if you just want to get involved in missions and listen, you know, that's not optional for the Christian. Mission work is not optional for the believers. Uh, we all are called to go and make disciples of all the nations in some form or some fashion. So if that works for you, these folks would love to get you hooked up and we would love to see you hooked up, amen or not. First John is where we need to be this morning, the second chapter, First John chapter 2. There's a uh, short little little announcement that I need to make that Josh is fixing to put on the screen. We've been given an invitation uh, to join with the fine folks at Wind Baptist. They're going to be doing a service March the 13th at 6 p.m. Uh, to support, to honor, and to pray for those who protect and serve us in Cross County, the uh, local law enforcement agencies. Uh, 6 p.m. or 6 to 8 on March the 13th at Wind Baptist. We've been invited to join them. If you want to go, and uh, I, I plan on being there, I hope you do too, uh, just to have a time of fellowship, to lift them up in prayer. I'll have a real short part in that somewhere, I think, and uh, come and be a part of that. Bring some food if you want to. There's going to be fellowship afterwards, uh, so come and be a part of that uh, on the 13th. Okay. Take your Bibles and turn to uh, 1 John chapter 2. Uh, we're going to start today in verse 7 and run to 14. That's where we're going to hitch up this morning. Uh, we've already learned so much from John uh, about the absolutes of true salvation and conversion. And uh, chapter 1, John says, Evidence of true salvation are those who walk uh, in the light or truth of God. He gives us another evidence as he expresses in chapter 2. Uh, true or genuine salvation are those who keep his commandments. So those who walk in the light, which is truth, and those who keep his commandments are two evidences uh, of genuine salvation in the life of the believer. To sum it up, or to put it in simpler terms, it can be said like this. Those who continue in the truth of God is one evidence. Uh, those who keep God's commands is another evidence of, of genuine conversion. We're going to see a, a third one today as we move uh, through the latter part of chapter 2. Today we'll see one. Let's read from verses 7 to 14, and then we'll go back and unpack what John has to say to us this morning. Y'all still glad you came to church? Verse 7, chapter 2, you there say amen. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because darkness has blinded his eyes. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, again for this privilege uh, to stand and unpack your word. And Lord, we want to rightly divide it as your word tells us to. 
Holy Spirit, we need you to do that. Uh, Father, we need you to teach us. We need you to open minds. We need you to open hearts this morning uh, that we might receive your word. Father, we pray that if there are those here who have never come to you for salvation, today would be the day that you, Lord, uh, would draw them that they may be saved. We pray, Father, for all distractions to be removed. Holy Spirit, teach us. Holy Spirit, change us. Holy Spirit, help us to not only hear your word, to receive your word, to not only be hearers of your word, to be doers of your word. And Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's hands said, amen. Amen. Chapter 2, verse 1, John uses the term or the phrase little children. Uh, He says it there as a as a term of endearment, to show his affection for these churches. John's an old apostle by this time, uh, and he, he looks toward these churches in Asia Minor in which he writes in these letters, or he wrote this letter to, and his love for them, he looks at them as, as they're his little children. In, in chapter se- or verse 7, he starts off with the word beloved, again, just reaffirming his love for them, his 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 caring attitude towards them. That's that's why he wrote this letter, because he sees these churches under attack uh, from these false teachers. He sees the danger in the lie that these false teachers are purveying, and his care for them, his love for them, is such that he literally is fighting for them, and he's for, fighting for them with the truth. Uh, and he says in verse 7, Beloved, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment, which you have heard from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. Uh, So he's talking about a singular command, a commandment. Not commandments, plural. He's talking about one thing. We need to know what that is before we really move any further And if we'll look at verse 10, we can very easily see in the context of the text that he's talking about the commandment to love the brethren. Verse 10 says, the one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. So he's referring to uh, directly in this passage, loving our brothers. Who are our brothers? I've got two brothers. Uh, and one sister, but that's, that's not exactly who he's talking about because these letters go to the churches. So he's referring to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me just ask you this question directly. Do you have a love for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Now, it's pretty easy to love those that go to three trees. We all get along for the most part. Uh, we all love each other. But what about our brothers and sisters in general. Let, let's just use the videos that we saw. What about those black preachers you saw from Africa? Do you have a love for them? You say, well, preacher, I don't even know them. Do you have to? No, you don't, because our love flows from what? Flows from our heart, but it flows from the understanding that they're God's kid, just like I'm God's kid. Those Hispanic preachers. Do you love them? Yeah, that's the love that should flow from us for the brethren. But really, really, that's the immediate uh, context of love because he names it, love for the brethren. But really, we see in Scripture that love goes a lot further than just those who are children of God like we're children of God. Scripture tells us uh, to love our neighbors. Who's your neighbor? Well, lots of us have neighbors that aren't children of God. Matter of fact, we're quite confident they're children of the devil. Amen or not? Uh, are we to love them? You better believe it. What about, uh, what about just strangers, people that, man, we, we bump into in the store or we pass on the highway? Are we to love them? Sure we are. Why is that? Because they're made in the image of God just like we are. We're to love them too, and that's an old command. John says, look, uh, I'm not writing a new commandment, 
I'm writing an old commandment in Leviticus 19.18, way back in the Levitical law, right after uh, the children of Israel were brought together and, and the kingdom of God was about to be, uh, start its voyage across the planet. Part of the law says, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you should love your neighbor as yourself. I am Lord. Love your neighbor as yourself. We're told in Deuteronomy to love God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our might. So love goes a lot further than just our brothers. That's a direct admonition, but it's, it's a lot broader than that. And he says, this is not an old commandment or this is not a new commandment, but it's a, an old commandment that I'm bringing with you, bringing to you. But in verse 8, the very next verse, John almost seemingly contradicts himself by saying, on the other hand, I am writing a new commandment. Hmm, that's interesting. Isn't it? I'm writing a new commandment to you. So is John contradicting himself when he says, uh, I'm, I'm writing to you an old commandment that you've already heard, that you already know, but hold on, it's a new commandment. Well, first of all, I don't think John is talking about time when he says old and new. I think John is talking about uh, the shine, <laughs> the relevance, the, 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 the ability for that command to influence us. I don't think he's talking about time when he says new and old. I think he's talking about uh, how we view that because over time, we tend to lose uh, affection toward things. Things tend not to uh, affect us as much as it used to, amen or not. Uh, I'll give you, for instance, I grew up on top of County Farm Hill down in Mariana, Arkansas, and they, as you turn off if you veer off the, the uh, highway there and you go back toward we where we live, there was a stop sign there. And it was a stop sign that when you were leaving the dirt to get on the highway, that stop sign, nobody stopped there. So when I was learning to drive, my instructions was stop at that stop sign. But I knew in my young mind, nobody stops at this stop sign. Nobody, except my daddy, he did. So as I was learning and I was doing things correctly because there were people in the car with me, I stopped at that stop sign. All the time, my mind was saying, I don't want to stop at this stop sign. I was being a bit rebellious. But after time went on and I began to drive by myself, I would stop at that stop sign in the beginning. But as time went on, the relevance of that stop sign became less and less and less. And guess what old brother Tracy started doing? <laughs> I started treating that stop sign like a yield sign. And after a little while, I didn't even treat it as a yield sign because you could see both ways. It was one of them deals. So I just kept on trucking. And so the commandment to love, even though it was part of the law, John says, uh, this is not a new command I give you, yet it is a new command. The, the, the next five words in verse 7 or verse 8 really tells us what's going on here. Let's read verse 8 again. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you. Who is him? Him is Jesus. When Jesus came, Jesus fulfilled the law. He fulfilled a law that you and I could not fulfill. There's no way we could live the, the mosaic system out. We would fail at it. They failed at it. Matter of fact, it was designed for those who tried to live it to fail because it showed us our sin. The law was a tutor. It, it revealed to us and those who tried to live the law that, man, I can't do this. I need help. And the help came in the person of Jesus Christ. So when John says, uh, which is true in him, what he is saying is that old command that no one could keep, Jesus kept. And he made it new. He put the shine back on it. 
Uh, he made it relevant and valuable. It, it now has an effect on us because as we read the Gospels, we read where Jesus lived out what love is supposed to look like. He loved everyone. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that begotten son went to the cross because he loved you and me. And he loved his father and he was obedient to his father. How, how can we possibly love those who are unlovable? How can we love those strangers? How, how can we love those neighbors that we don't like? By the way, liking and loving is two entirely different things. Amen or not? You ever been hungry? Now, I'm not just talking about it's, it's 1230 and you, you're used to eating at 12. I'm talking about, man, you ain't been around food in a long time. Like, like your backbone is kind of gnawing on your gut. That kind of hungry. Well, whatever comes to you first when you're in that situation, you may not like it, but boy, you're sure in love with eating it. That, that's the difference in like and love. And, and we love people because Christ has made us new and that Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, has now taken up residence in the temple of God, which is who? All God's children. He lives within me. He lives within you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And he promotes that love within you. Uh, he, 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 he promotes loving the stranger, loving the neighbor, loving those who are unlovable, loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. And by the way, this is the third evidence of genuine salvation. How many of y'all remember when you first got saved? Okay, there's 12 safe people in here. I need to switch this message. You know you're going to hell without Jesus. You know that. How many of you remember when you first got saved? Yeah. Maybe today some of you will get saved. Listen, listen, I'm, I'm going to tell you a true story about me. The night I got saved... I told some of this story the other day. It might have been Bryce, and we was going down a D-wit. When I got saved, and I got saved in the spare bedroom of my house, when I walked out of that bedroom, and I had poured my guts out to Jesus, he filled me back up with him. And I walked out in the hall of that house that I was living in, 407 West Main Street, Hughes, Arkansas. And I walked out in the hall of that, that house, and it was like a, a breeze blew across me. Now, I'm not trying to tell you something that just to make, make this. I'm not embellishing this. I'm just telling you, man, when I walked down that hall, it was like a breeze blew over me. And the craziest thought coming to my mind, it don't even make sense. But when that, that feeling come over me, I remember the first thing I thought was, I'm not prejudiced anymore. Crazy, ain't it? What does that mean? That means I was prejudiced before that happened. And the love of Christ moved into me and the Holy Ghost moved into me. I couldn't do that anymore. I just couldn't be that way no more. God wouldn't let me do that. I had a love for my brother, a love for my sister, a love for my neighbor. I didn't say like. I said, I love for my neighbor, for the guy down the street, the guy at the Exxon, everyone that I come across, I come to realize that all are made in the image of God. And they're valuable to God. And if God loves them, I got to love them too. And the more you do something, even though you don't want to, the easier it gets. And eventually it works into just being part of who you are. Why can I love today? Because Jesus loved. Notice the rest of verse 8. On the other hand, I'm writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him, watch this, and in you. There's the evidence. That's another evidence of genuine salvation. Now, let's go on. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Remember, 
Darkness and light cannot coexist. It cannot be dark and light. When the sun, which lights up the world, breaks the horizon in the morning, darkness begins to flee, and it doesn't run toward the sun. It runs away from the sun, and it becomes dark somewhere else. The love of Christ, which reigns and rules and is exhibited in the life of the believer, that is light, and darkness flees from it. It can't coexist. If all of the world, let me just say this, if all of God's people, all the people who claim to be of children of God, if they love the way Christ loved, how different would the world be? Be way different. Let me just tell you this morning, if we all loved on planet Earth like Jesus Christ, one of the first things you'd see happening is Russia pulling out of Ukraine and going back and then seeing in reparations. I think I said that word right. For the buildings they've blown up and the lives they've taken, and the crops they've destroyed. That's what love does. Verse 9. The one who says he is in the light, yet hates his brother, is in the darkness until now, until now, until Jesus has come. Jesus has come. He has exemplified love. Now we have an example to live by, not just a law to try to go by, but an example to follow. Jesus the Christ. And no matter what we say, now I want you to listen to God's word this morning. God's word simply saying, if you hate your brother, no matter what you say, you are living in darkness. If you're living in darkness, you cannot be present with light. Let me put it in Arkansas's language. If you hate your brother, you're lost. You're going to hell. That's what the Bible says. Now, we, being the good falling folks that we are, we, we kind of have a way of, oh man, we have a way of kicking the can, don't we? Yeah, we, we have a way of wiggling and, and just, well, I don't really hate them. You sure? You sure you don't hate them? Well, it's like you said, preacher, I just don't really like them. Be careful playing with that word like and hate and love. Be really careful. Let let me help you out with that hate thing. If they're always on your mind in a negative sense, that's probably hate. If you're holding that grudge and, and, and you're just waiting on the opportunity to get them back, that's probably hate. Kind of like Jeff Foxworth says, you might be a redneck. If they're staying on your mind and you're just waiting to spring on them, you might be hating them. If, if, if what happened between you and them or just their mere existence, if that just stays with you all the time, yeah, that's hatred. And by the way, uh, this, the, the sense of this word hate is continual, just like the sense of walking in the light, just like the sense of practicing the truth. It's continual. John is really good at drawing this line. And on this side, it's very clear and very evident. They're children of the devil. And on this side, it's very clear and very evident. There's evidence for a conversion that's taken place. A heart that can no longer hate is what is to exist in the child of God. John clearly says, no one who says he is in the light... He says he's in the light. No one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. You can't, you can't do that. Now, why is he saying this? Because you've got to remember, why is he writing this letter? These false teachers. And they've got all kind of twisted theology. They don't believe anything done in the flesh matters because flesh can't inherit the kingdom of God. A little bit of truth to that on the end. They also thought of themselves as having a higher relationship and understanding of God than the average Christian. And obviously they were practicing hatred. They were practicing hatred and John's calling them out. 
And John is calling those who are true born-again Christians to come back and center themselves on the truth. And John is calling them who are dabbling with darkness to come back to the light. Now, we'll know in a little while that there was some who absolutely abandoned the faith. And John says they went out from us because they were never really a part of us. So you got all that going on with these churches in Asia Minor as these Gnostic false teachers are rising up and doing damage. And he loves them too much to not tell them the truth. By the way, how many know that's a real thing? To love someone too much to not share the truth with you. That's a real thing. Verse 10. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. The one who loves his brother abides in the light. Love operates in light. Love operates in light. Light represents God. Light represents truth. That's where love operates. That's where you find love. That's what love flows from. Hatred operates in the dark. That's where hatred stems from, is in the dark. John clearly says in verse 10, the one who loves his brother abides or remains in Christ. He remains, he abides in the light. And there is no cause for stumbling. That's where we stumble in the darkness, not in the light. It's in the darkness is where we stumble. Verse 11. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because darkness has blinded his eyes. How many of you know darkness is emblematic of sin? Darkness represents sin in this passage. The one who walks in darkness... That is, they live apart from truth, they live apart from life, has not the Holy Spirit to illuminate their lives. They cannot see because they live in continual darkness. You know, we think about why why has life been so devalued on planet Earth? Life really uh, has not much of a meaning. Let me tell you about our, 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 our Senate. They just, re, I'm probably going to say this wrong. They just reconvened. No, it come, it come to me when I've been over. I may try that in there often. Uh, they just reconvened. Evidently, they've been on recess. Now, this was just first part of the week. I was listening to Jay Seculo, a Christian radio commentary. They reconvened. They'd been on vacation. Been on vacation while there's a potential war looming, a global war war. They were on vacation. That's nonetheless. But when they came back, they reconvened. I got that word figured out. I like to use it now as much as I can. They reconvened. Come back together. First item of business. Now there's a conflict going on in Europe between Russia and Ukraine. By the way, anybody didn't know that? And I don't even watch the news, but I know that. This conflict, I mean, let's just be real. This thing could go global. It's serious. So Congress and Senate comes back to order their first item of business. Ukraine, right? Russia, right? No. You know what it was? It was to pass a bill. Here's another word. Boy, I'm good on these big words today. You ready for this? Codifying. (sighs) Codifying. Roe v. Wade. Codifying it, which means this bill would, would so embed it in law that states with states' rights could not undo it. The world's burning down. Nuclear arsenals are on standby. Your Senate and your Congress, the first item 
to take action on is not what do we do to protect the world. It's what do we do to take more lives. That's where we're at in America. You think about that next time you go vote. And all of you who say, ain't worried about voting, you deserve it. You deserve it. You better get rest. Well, Arkansas always votes conservative. Doesn't matter how we vote. Man, do you want to stand before Jesus and say, I was inactive? Do you want to stand before Jesus and say, man, I know the world was burning down, but heck, I didn't care. But the reason life is so devalued, it didn't, it's not because of abortion. abortion. Abortion is a symptom of a larger problem, which is we don't care about life. We don't care. Where did it all start? I'm going to tell you where it started. Where it really took a turn is when our kids, and I'm speaking from my childhood memory, when our kids started seeing posters on the bulletin boards in their science classes which showed a man coming from a monkey. That's when life started being devalued right there. I mean, what else can you, can you expect from kids who's, who think, well, good grief. My relatives were monkeys. You come from a monkey, but the Bible says you were created in the image of God. Which one are you going to believe? Well, you listen to the preacher for 30 minutes on Sunday mornings, but you got a science teacher for an hour every day of the week. Which one are you going to believe? And we started letting that stuff be taught in our schools, and the next thing you know, hey, abortion's running rampant. Uh, next thing you know, we don't care. And if you don't think that influences you, listen to me, friend. If you don't think you're, you've been desensitized about life, when you watch the news and you hear that someone was murdered in Memphis, Tennessee, or West Memphis, Arkansas, or Wynn, Arkansas, and you go, hmm, I wonder what's on the next channel. You've been desensitized. And if you don't think that hatred can become normal in you, all of the crude jokes that we spew out, that's just a symptom of a dark place in us. And when we think that stuff is funny, that reveals the darkness in us. And John said, if you walk in that darkness, you don't belong to Jesus. Tracy says, according to God's word, if you don't belong to Jesus, you're going to hell. And that's how all this sneaks up on us. And here we are. Man, we've arrived. We've got camels carrying iPods, iPads across the desert to get to Jesus to people. But we hate our brothers. We've come a long ways, baby. We have in some ways. But we've devolved as humans. Here's why. Moving out of the light. Constantly moving out of the light. John says, if you hate your brother, you're walking in darkness. Doesn't matter what you say. Doesn't matter how heavy your Bible is. Doesn't matter which church you go to. If you hate your brother, you're living in darkness. That's what John says. And that darkness blinds you. Let me tell you, I can cut them lights out right now back there. I, I, I go through here every day. This is a dark building. I, I can cut them lights out. You guys on the front are in trouble getting to those back doors. Because you can see the light back there. But because you ain't been in here enough and these, these aisles run at an angle, you're going to be thinking, man, I'm going to the light. I'm going to the light. Oh, 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 oh. Darkness blinds. It blinds us. And those living in darkness are continually blinded. 
This is the seriousness of these letters that John writes to these churches at Asia Minor because of the false teachers that are purveying lies in these, in these churches. Verse 12, I am writing to you little children. Now, remember, he's used that phrase, little children, in chapter 2, verse 1. But he uses it in chapter 2 and verse 1 as, as a broad sense of love, as a term of endearment about the churches that he's over. He's overseer of these churches. But here in verse 12, I'm writing to you little children. He, he, he's, he's talking to little children. He addresses three groups of people in verses 12, 13, and 14. He addresses little children. He addresses young men. And he addresses fathers. Now, think about it. Fathers, young men, and children, all of them are representative of different levels of spiritual maturity, the way it should be. Uh, in the church, fathers should be more spiritually mature than young men. Why? Because they've lived longer knowing Jesus. They've studied longer. They have more knowledge of Jesus. Now, I know that's not always the case, but it should be. And then the young men are at a level of maturity. And then the children are the vulnerable ones. Let's read verses 12, 13, and 14. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven. Forgiven you for his name's sakes. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Fathers. You know him from the beginning. Young men, you have overcome the evil one. Children, because you know the Father. He's talking to safe folks. He's, he's talking to folks who know Jesus. But he sees the, the imminent destruction that these false teachers are bringing to these churches. Verse 14, he, he just simply repeats what he's already said. You know him who has been from the beginning. He says something somewhat different to the young men. He says, you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. He doesn't mention the children again. I see an appeal from John, appealing to the church, starting with the fathers, going to the young men an appeal to watch over the church, to protect the integrity of what is being taught, to not allow the false teachers to intrude uh, and to find, worm their way into the congregations of these church. Those who are more mature has to look out after those who are not as mature and on down the line. Uh, the young men, very capable because of the word of God that abides in them. John appeals to them. This appeal is to look after the most vulnerable in the congregation, which would be the younger ones. Deception is what's coming from these false teachers. The fathers who know Jesus, who has been uh, from the beginning, they know more about God and his attributes. Now listen to me, fathers. That's a call for us to be familiar with God and familiar with his word, to be teachers of our homes, to look after the flock of God. Well, pastor, that's your job. No, that's our job. No pastor can be everywhere at one time. Well, pastor, we've got two other pastors here now. No one can be everywhere at all times. I'm not in your home you're to look over your home and help us look over this church. Well, pastor, that, that was 2,000 years ago. Uh, you don't have to worry about that in the 21st century in Cowboy Church. No, you have to worry about it more. World's full of wackos that call themselves preachers. 
Words full of nut jobs who try to handle the word of God. They've got motives. They've got agendas. Usually it's money. And we've been called by John, the fathers, the young men. Listen to me, young men. You have overcome so much, according to John. You're strong because God's word abides in you. Listen to me, young man. Cut Facebook off. Put your device up. Put them silly games up. In the name of Jesus, un- unplug, man. Good grief. I, man, I, I talked to 35, 40-year-old men sitting there twiddling their thumbs on some electronic advice. Your family's going to hell, man. Put that game up. That's not going to gain you anything. Well, I'm high score. No, you're a loser. That's what you are playing them games while your family's not being taught the word of God. Are you kidding me? I'm a gamer. What? What? How much do your kids know about Jesus? Are you leading your wife in the word of God? Now look, I I already know by your faces I've made some of you mad. Look. I love you too much not to tell you the truth. Unplug, dude. Take your wife by the hand, sit at the table with her, gather your children around. I bet you can teach them how to reach the high score on that game, but can you tell them how to receive eternal life? Can you, can you explain to them what water baptism's all about? Preacher, that's your job. Well, you better start inviting me to your house more often. Cook me a steak. <laughs> Ribeye. No sirloin stuff. I don't want none of that tough meat. Amen or not? Now look, seriously, guys, that's the culture which we live in. Our kids, man, they grow up through Sunday school, which we don't have Sunday school, but we've got children's church. And let me tell you, I, I was on the phone this morning at, at 7 o'clock with one of our teachers who just committed to teach our kids for three months straight. Glory to God. <laughs> let me just say this while everybody's mad at me. Everybody in here that has kids who goes to that kid's barn has an obligation in some way to be participating in that kid's barn. You do. You do. You're obligated as a parent. Well, I don't want to watch them. Well, you shouldn't have had them. (laughs) Shouldn't have had them. But now they're here. You can't put them boogers back. You can figure to raise them rascals. (laughs) But, But why wouldn't we be obligated? Huh? Sure, we need to be obligated. You know, our kids, I I used this example in the first service. And this this statistically is so easy to prove. You ain't mad, are you? Okay, all right. (laughs) This is so statistically easy to prove. We send our kids off to college. Kids, good kids, who have been raised in church, who have listened to preachers like me, who have sat under teachers likes over there in the kids' barn, and, and they take them little old jugs full of mush slopping around, and they go off to college, and that old liberal professor who stands in front of them every day uh, for three and a half, four years, completely changes everything they ever thought they believed. Now, why is that? I'll tell you why. Because what they thought they believed was never, here's my word again, codified at home. My daddy went to the third grade. He was from that cotton-picking generation. Could do arithmetic like, he still amazes me. I'm so dumb compared to him. Daddy never was a preacher and daddy never was a Sunday school teacher. Can I just tell you, you ain't got to be. You ain't got to be a preacher. You don't have to teach Sunday school. But every day of my life, my dad lived Jesus 
before me. Every day, the most honest man I ever knew is my daddy. If he found a $100 bill laying in the road, he would do his best to find out who that money belonged to because he knew it wasn't his. Well, we've lost that. We don't teach our kids these things. John's fighting for the church. I'm fighting for the church. John sees these false prophets rising up in the church. He loves these churches. They're his little children. He's calling on the fathers. He's calling on the young men. Protect the integrity of the gospel. Don't let these false prophets rise up. Don't you dare let them change what you believe. Know what you believe. Know why you believe it. Listen to me, dads. Your kids need to know what they believe. They need to know why they believe it. And it's your job to teach it. And it don't just stop at home. It goes to this church. Listen to me, man. God's created us and designed us to protect the integrity of this church, to promote the gospel, the truth of God's word. Not some feel-good thing so we can fill this building up, but the truth of God's word. Because our children are going to take this deal called church life over from us. And John says, Father's... Because you have known him who has been from the beginning. You know the eternal God. Young men, because you've overcome the evil one. Young men, because you have the word of God abiding in you. Protect the church. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Beware of false prophets. Beware of false teachers. Dressed in sheep's clothing, because inwardly they're ravenous wolves. You would never, ever let something run off with one of your children without fighting. But yet we do it every day. Matter of fact, we actually hand our kids over to them, don't we? We really do. Who would wolves prey on if, if, a, if a pack of wolves were going to attack, which is what Jesus said these false teachers are, who would they attack first? The weak, the most vulnerable, those who aren't spiritually mature, those who will follow foolishness and silliness, those who like to have their ears tickled, who has never really grounded And built a foundation on God's word. Those are the ones. Listen, the same thing could happen in this church that was happening in those churches at Asia Minor. God calls us to protect the church, to protect our children from the false teachers. Beware. This morning, beware. Make sure that the man who stands here preaches the word of God. I won't be here forever. And if I drift off into loony land, some of you men need to march up this stage and snatch me off here so quick, my boots stay behind. That's true. Protect the pulpit. Protect the integrity of God's word. And you'll be protecting your children, not just at church, but at home. Amen or not? Well, hello, everybody. My name is Tracy Wilson. Thank you so much for being with us uh, via Facebook or YouTube or however you're watching us, whether it be a Wednesday night round pen or a Sunday morning uh, service here at the Cowboy Church. Just wanted to say hello and give you a personal invite to come and be with us here at the Cowboy Church. Uh, There's three options for you. Sunday mornings, we have a 9 a.m. service, uh, and then a second service at 1030 a.m., And then on Wednesday nights, uh, we do what we call a round pen Bible study, which is just getting into the heart of God's Word and studying it for all it's worth. We would love to meet with you uh, here in person at the Cowboy Church. We're so thankful for uh, technology. We've gotten uh, comments on our uh, sermons and Bible studies uh, all the way from Africa. And so we're so thankful. But uh, we do want to invite you here with us. 
to be uh, in person, in house at the Cowboy Church. You know, the Bible says this about salvation. The Bible says clearly in Ephesians 2, 8, that salvation is by grace through faith, not of works, so no man can boast. Our prayer is that through these messages and through these Bible studies, uh, that the Word of God would uh, find its place in your heart. The promise is that God's Word will not return void. So we want to make ourselves available to you uh, for any thing that we can do to help you. If you have questions about this Jesus that we preach about, this Jesus that we serve, this Jesus that we know as our Savior and that the Bible declares as the only Savior, He is the way, the truth, and the life. If you would have a question about that, if we could help you with that, or if God deals with your heart through one of our sermons or Bible studies, and you've responded to that, and you've put your hope and trust, and you've committed to follow Jesus Christ, we would love to celebrate with you about that. We'd love to talk with you about that, help you in any way that we can. If you're watching, then obviously you have Facebook or uh, the availability of YouTube. Uh, if we can do anything, I would love for you to personally message me on Facebook. And I would love to correspond with you about this. God is able, and He is able to meet all of our needs. He has extended His grace to us uh, through the offer of forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. I hope that you have taken advantage of that. I hope that you belong to Christ. And please take advantage of Three Trees Cowboy Church. Being here in person or just allowing us to message with you and help you in any way we can. Until then, until we see you in person or we see that message, God bless you and thank you for being with us.